Hello, I'm Stan Stoniker here in Hub Culture Davos at the campus, featuring now four properties here in the heart of the conversation during the World Economic Forum. Joining me now is Jeremy Collar, the founder and chief investment officer of Collar Capital. Today we're talking over lunch with a great group of people about purpose-driven investing. What is that? What does that mean? It does link a little bit to the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, and something called ESG, Environmental and Social Governance. And this is an area of investing that has moved over the last 10 years from the periphery of many investment funds in the mainstream investment community, now to the very center of progressive capitalism and some of the largest funds in the world. So Jeremy, I think of you as not only a friend, but a person who has been at the forefront of this movement, because you have always been a purpose-driven investor. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and Collar Capital and what purpose-driven investment means to you? Yeah, so, um, you know, I used to play lip service to ESG and environmental social governance. Uh, we had a fiduciary responsibility to get the best return for our pension funds that we represent, etc. And then, um, ESG really took off the ground, environmental social governance, and basically what it means, so it's not about impact investing, it's about the whole gamut of investing, everything that you do. So it's saying, pension plans are now saying, what's the point of having a pension if the temperature is too hot to live in? Pension plans are now saying, we want to make sure there are foundations and fire exits for, for a textile factory we're building because it's good business. We don't really care about human rights. You know, it's not our job, but it, it's all about good business. It's all about materiality, not morality. And if you inject that into uh, your investment process, you get better returns. In fact, you could argue that the only way that you can justify active management fees, which means higher management fees, is through environmental social governance. So let me give you some examples of that. One would be, uh, well, let, let me just say first that ESG, I did play lip service, you know, everyone has their own um, lens that they look through the world on. So for me, you know, I'm vegetarian, been vegetarian since I'm 12, we avoided investing in abattoirs and factory farms, etc. But you know that was just a personal, a personal um, way of thinking. You know, others might not be in guns or brothels or whatever, whatever the whatever the particular um, lens that people there are people look through themselves. Okay, people are laughing in the audience at me. Um, and and. Uh, you know, I, and then you, could, you start seeing that actually environmental social governance have strict rules and strict lenses to look through. You know, and I, I, you know, in the big world, you've got, you remember the Volkswagen diesel crisis? That's governance. Uh, Macanto, which was BP, was environmental and governance. You can have social, you can have reputational risk. Um, and, uh, you know, so th there's all these risks that encompasses everything. So it really is about looking at not just the impact of your investment, but the whole, like, ecosystem of the investment. Yeah, and uh, let, let me give you an example through my lens. So we bought um, a myeloma cancer diagnostic company, and it uses, it's actually sheep don't get cancer, just a bit of trivia. Sheep don't get cancer, so you, you put the blood of sheep into human, and it is 100% accurate on my own cancer diagnostic because it attaches to the bone. And uh, they use 2,000, this company, Great EBITDA Growth, we're gonna make a lot of money on it, uses 2,000 sheep a year. And, and, I, and I, you know, I'm slightly uncomfortable because I'm vegetarian, et cetera. So I, I, I say to them, they say to me, I ask them, you know, how long do the sheep live for? They say, well, their teeth um, grind down, and, you know, they get to live twice as long as a regular sheep. Lamb, you know, lamb that you eat is two years old, these live for a whole four years. And I Googled, how long does a sheep live for? It's 22 years. So I made a condition that, um, 
the sheep have to live out their full and natural lives. And, and you might think of that as costing money, but we went out to check the, 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 the sheep farms in, um, in Vermont, in the US, and, and all the sheep were kept inside. Even though it was a big farm, they were all kept in, in, uh, in, internally because of the coyote, the foxes. And, and so our sustainable guy went over and saw this and said to them, well, why not put um, solar systems onto all the land that you've got? The sheep will mow the lawn. You've got electricity for the barn and for the cost of uh, guards for the coyotes, etc. cetera. And, and you can actually put um, uh, electricity into the grid. You know, that's a different lens of looking through, um, looking through investment process. So it's really interesting because I, I think it's quite cool how you start with this idea of you have a personal conviction, whatever it is, and then that kind of comes into your investment lens and how you then make decisions, and then that actually amplifies out through different things. And in a few minutes, I'd love to get into the story of how your vegetarianism has resulted in you becoming one of the biggest investors in food. The biggest. The biggest. Um, before we do that, let's like bring it out to the audience here. What does purpose-driven investing mean to you? Can we ask Morgan Stanley, who actually are all, have authentically um, come up? Oh, so head of sustainability. A lot of banks pay, are now saying they're into climate, etc. And what they mean by that is, is um, you know, investment. It's all good. Morgan Stanley, surprisingly, because you'd never expect this have been the most advanced on, on sustainability. Your chief sustainable sustainability yeah, officer, what does that mean? Well, well thank you so much, and I, I feel like I'm back. And this in, is co-creation, and it's best right Exactly, here, so. I feel like I'm back in business school being cold called for the case that I didn't know I was gonna talk yeah. about, but um, thank you. Um, so we at Morgan Stanley, we started this um, actually about 11 years ago that we created a global sustainable finance group. And we did it really saying, um, you know, that we believe that capital markets, well, I, and I'll, this is, you know, so since we're talking personal journeys, also one of my beliefs, having been in nonprofits and also in government, is that I really do believe that business can be the most powerful change, force for change in the world if you let it and if you ask it to be. Can I, can I correct you? Yes. Sorry, because you're talking about business, which is all about corporate social responsibility in no, a way. I think that's the, 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 the investors, yeah. the owners, are, this is just, a, just have a say, an important point, because you're on the investor side actually as well, is that the, you know, the, it's a different lens that we're talking about. So CSR, which has fallen by the wayside now in a way, because mm -hmm. it was business C-suite saying, you know, let's do good in the community, let's do this. But you know that if you own a business, you can force change because you know the, the the owners will tell you what to do, and and so that's what that's the difference between ESG and the CSR. Yeah. It's about the owner. It's about the investors. Yeah. Well, I, I totally agree. I think that um, when I say business, or you know, is the you know can be one of those powerful forces of change. It's not. Again, it's not the largesse of business with the leftover extra profit that they want to use to be nice. It's about actually thinking about the business systems and the processes and exactly you said, the entire value chain. And, um, and then as Morgan Stanley thought that our biggest point of leverage was because we sit in the capital markets, you know, having hundreds of trillions of dollars sloshing back and forth every day, if we could bring, figure out how to harness the power of the capital markets to serve in, in, in environmental or social ends, that could be really powerful. Um, but we're also very cognizant that Morgan Stanley is not a nonprofit, we're not a government, we're not a philanthropy, and investors aren't going to entrust us with their money if we weren't really delivering the right, you know, the right returns, the right appropriate, um, the appropriate risk adjusted rate of returns. So for us, sustainable investing has really been exactly as you said, Jeremy, how do we bring an understanding of environmental issues and social issues and governance issues into the most rigorous investment process possible? and use that to actually enhance returns or reduce risk or ideally both. Um, and you know, I think what's, what's been the most exciting thing for us is that we've spent a lot of time over the last 11 years looking at the data and doing the work. And I'll just give you like one quick bit, bit of data. We did a um, analysis, because people always say, you know, it's lovely to say that, but really you're giving up return. So we examined 11,000 
um, investment funds over a 15-year performance period and compare the sustainable strategies to the traditional strategies. And we found two really, I think, interesting things. One is, if you plot the returns of the traditional strategies, right, you get the normal bell curve distribution. So some managers were unlucky and not so great, some managers were lucky and good, and most of them were in between. If you then plotted the sustainable strategies, miraculously, it also was a normal bell curve distribution that sat right on top of the other curve. So there was nothing magically horrible or magically wonderful about injecting sustainability. The really interesting difference is though when you looked at the downside deviation, there was less volatility of the sustainability strategies, and when it did have a downside, it was 20% less. Than. And so it goes exactly to your point. It gives you an early warning system on risk, on, on also operational risk, reputational risk, and I've never yet met an investor that says they didn't want to have the same return with less risk. Um, so we've been really focusing on that, and um, I, I'll stop talking because I just, but I just wanted to mention two quick things, which is we're so excited that you know that this is really sort of on the mainstream agenda now. Again, we think it always should have been. Um, super excited about what we're seeing in terms of the forward trends. Right, the millennials have clearly been leading the way on this for years. You know, 95 percent or more of millennials they want sustainable investing, they want transparency, they want to be able to understand the entire value chain of products they use, wear, or eat, or. Um, or invest in, um, and um, they really expect to, to put their money where their mouth is, and they believe that it makes a difference. More than 75, 85% of them believe their personal investment choices can make a difference on things like climate change um, or, um, or poverty reduction. Can I pull you up on that yeah. for a moment? Which is, so in this room, who has written, or on Facebook Live, who has you all own businesses, you know, most of you own McDonald's and Tyson and all of these other companies because they're public companies and the largest pool of capital in the world today is pension money. So with your savings as you invest, you know, now how many of you have, have written a simple letter asking your pension provider or your savings provider, so it's a lot of waffle around. But how many of you, this is a call to action by the way, how many of you have actually written to Morgan Stanley or whoever, you, if you're rich enough to be with Morgan Stanley, um, if, or whoever, um, and said, you know, can you give me a, a breakdown what, what affects, what, uh, what you're doing about climate change? Or, you know, as we're doing, what are you doing about antibiotics in the food supply chain? Are you, how are you managing that risk? You know, no one does that. And this is the, you know, in a sense, this is the next step of capitalism and ownership. That, you know, it is, in the US, in the UK, in many countries, the owners of assets are actual the civil population. And they're so disconnected from my assets. Wall Street is a vehicle for good. Yeah, well, I, I have to say, I mean, you know, we've definitely seen that when the choices are there, then investors are voting with, you know, with their feet and choosing those options. And, you know, for example, one of the things that we just did um, in 2019 is we announced the, the Morgan Stanley Plastic Waste Resolution, where given the astronomical growth of the plastic waste challenge we're all facing, we said, you know, we want to do our part. Again, we're not a big maker of plastic or a disproportionately large user of plastic, but um, it's such a complicated issue with so many parts of the value chain, and one of the things more recently does do is touch every bit of that. Chemical companies, consumer companies, individuals, municipal waste management facilities, governments. Um, so we've committed that we want to help facilitate the um, prevention, reduction, and removal of 50 million tons of plastic waste from rivers, oceans, and landfills by 2030. What's been amazing though was the response that we've had you know, from employees but also from investors. Like one of the um, things that we did is we created low dollar minimum a portfolio. So for as little as $10,000, so you don't have to be astronomically rich to be the point, at $10,000 people could invest in a portfolio that was focused on companies looking at plastic waste reduction. The growth of, of assets into that has been extraordinarily rapid. And we've gotten, in just a few months, we've actually crossed the $100 million mark 
of, and these are people making you know, $10,000 investments to say, I care about this issue and I want to align my investments with it. So I think that you're absolutely right. The power of the investor, whether it's the largest pension funds in the world or you know, first-time investors is, um, is really, really strong and institutions on Wall Street is listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's great to get that version from the So I think uh, what I'd love to do now is to go into a little group exercise. So if you're on Facebook, close your eyes. If you're in the room, close your eyes. Just think for a second about what life was like when you were 12 years old. Remember where you were. And if, if you saw yourself then, and you think about purpose, what would you say to that 12 year old? And I'm gonna start with Jeremy for that answer. Um, I was a fucking disaster. Sorry, I was, uh, I, I was a disaster at 12 years old. Um, but but I, I didn't even answer that. Uh, but I became vegetarian at 12. And, you know, I, I mean, I was a disaster. I, my father just died, blah, 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 you know. And, um, uh, and then I became vegetarian and, you know, uh, I didn't believe in the way some animals are brought up, but I didn't know, I was too young to know which ones. But I was really bad at school, etc. cetera. And then, and then 40 years later, um, I decided to change my life. So if someone had done that, uh, Someone had asked to write my obituary, and I said, you know, what the hell are you talking about? And he, I said, well, I'm really happy to 100. And he wrote it, and we went skiing together. He said, he said I've written it, and um, you die tomorrow. And you've, um, you've pioneered and led a whole industry, you've made a lot of money, and you're a total bull. And then he said, and then he said I've written another one. You died at 98, not at 100, but you, um, you, business school named after you, changed pension policy in Africa, and, and I was sitting there on my deathbed at 98 years old, and I said, um, bless you, amen. Um, I said, uh, I said uh, um, you know, actually if I could save a few cows from a concentration camp, I'd be authentically proud of myself. And I thought everyone would laugh. And, and then, and then um, I started, Four years ago, a group, uh, a network called Fair, F A I R R dot org, Farm Animal Investment Risk Inventor. Within four years, we've got a network together, talking about Wall Street, of over twenty trillion dollars, twenty point one trillion dollars, which is a big network. And I'll, t I'll tell you the type of things we've done. We've came up with four inconvenient truths about factory farming which is that um, it's the number one user of antibiotics worldwide, it's the number one user of fresh water worldwide, number one reason for deforestation, more greenhouse gases than the, than the transport sector, and uh, food security. So we're feeding 70 billion animals to feed 7 billion humans. And we just came up with that, and then we applied the lens of the investor. And the lens of the investor is, for instance, it could be a greenhouse, a climate change tax, a meat tax. There could be um, there could be an epidemic with class actions. There could be um, you know a ban on using antibiotics like Jerry Brown has done in, in Governor of California a year ago. And so we looked through the lens, and we then um, our first engagement was with uh, um, was with restaurant chains and antibiotics. You have to give the animals more room if you don't give them antibiotics. But the lens we used was, uh, it's an investment risk. And, um, and we engaged with 20 restaurant chains, McDonald's, Burger King, Young Brands, uh, which is KFC, etc. And in 2016, in April 2016, none of them, not one, had a policy on limiting the use of antibiotics. By 2019, by engaging with these restaurant chains, global restaurant chains, as owners, so we own them as pension funds, etc. All 20 had committed to dates when they'd stop the everyday use of antibiotics in the food supply chain. 
That is the power of money. Going from Netflix to Wall Street is incredibly powerful, and I must say a lot easier than going through government, because, uh, you know, we're all individuals in the investment world. You know, they're, they're, they're thought of as um, leeches, and I've been called everything, locusts, um, you know, a Wall Street camera, but it's just regular people. And they haven't had, they haven't had, um, they haven't had an ability to express themselves with, you know, you're going for short-term fiduciary responsibility. And with the rise of environmental social governance, which has swept the world over the last 10 years, is sweeping the world, they've suddenly got that lens to look through. So, to your point, your question is, um, my 98-year-old self is really proud of my 12-year-old self. And my 61-year-old self, which I am now, is, and my 55-year-old self was so proud of that 12-year-old boy, and he's proud of me. And you're looking at the largest investor in alternative means, alternative means. He funded, this, this guy funded a revolution in food over the last 10 years. He put his money where his mouth is and he helped get beyond me. Who knew that doing foods. good, who knew that doing good by investing in, in food tech could make Name the companies that you helped get started in this space. Oh no, there's too Something. many. From Beyond Meat to Impossible Burger to Memphis Meals. Perfect Day is a great one. Today, you know, with, 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 from fax machines to digital, everything, Facebook and everything else, why would you brew milk in the breast of a cow when you can brew exactly the same thing in a brewery? It's a company called Perfect Day, their, their first product ice cream. Uh, but, you know, they're making milk that can make any cheese without harming a cow. Why wouldn't we do that? This and is why no antibiotics or mercury from the fish. So growing fish, growing leaves. Is yeah, sustainable shrimp run away out of seaweed. So this is why I wanted you to hear Jeremy's story today, because when you close your eyes and think about your 12-year-old self, think for a minute about what was important for you then, and what mattered to you, and then look at your investment strategy today and see if they align. Because if they don't, you know, maybe we can shift. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone, thank you. So we have coffee, and is Maria here yet? Jeremy, has Maria arrived? So we also have champagne because it's Maria's birthday. So um, we have a little champagne toast for Fair and the, the work that they're doing. So um, hopefully she'll be here soon, and if not, we're just going to have to pop it ourselves. Okay, enjoy, enjoy.